Hello, I am Zarkoon and this is World of Warships Legends. Now today, I originally wanted to show you a video of the Tier 7 Premium British Battleship Lion. However, I just haven't had a lot of fun while playing that ship, and every time I log on to this game, at least every time I've logged on this week, the only ship I've wanted to play is the Minotaur. So I figured, since I showed you my first impressions video in the Minotaur a couple of days ago, and I was playing with the smokescreen Minotaur, I would show you a video with the radar Minotaur, and talk about a little bit of the differences in gameplay between those two. Plus, in my original video on the Minotaur, I did not have the main battery reload mod installed, because I was poor. I had spent a lot of silver on other things, but now, after grinding out some silver, I've put the main battery reload module on this ship, and its shells fire every 2.8 seconds, which is insane. Fastest firing rate of any light cruiser in this game, and it just melts other ships. I've also got the Commander guys applied to Bruce Frazier. It sort of turns his picture into Miss Santa Claus, and if that floats your boat or whatever, great, but essentially all the Commander guys does is put these little colorful shell tracers on your shells. You can see they're red here. Anytime somebody comes within my legendary skill range, I'm using fully packed, the ship launches some fireworks, so it's very obvious when the legendary skill is procced. And then finally, if you use your horn, a single flare shoots out of like the smokestack of a ship, and it's, it's just a little visual thing. Um... In order to apply a commander, guys, you simply go to the commander profile, you press on the right stick, and you can apply the commander, guys. It does all these cosmetic things for you, and it changes the portrait of the historical commander to a portrait of one of the attractive female guises, and perhaps that's your thing. Not really my thing, but I do like these red shell tracers. Anyway, Radar Minotaur. This radar has a range of 9.9 .9 kilometers, same as our detectability range. That means if we're unspotted and we suddenly get spotted, we know that whatever is spotting us is within our radar range and we are perfectly okay to pop the radar consumable. If you do get spotted, though, and you previously weren't spotted with this kind of concealment and this kind of radar range, it may be best to wait for a few seconds to ensure that whatever is spotting you has pushed in a little bit further into your radar range so that when you activate the radar, they're trapped in it and they can't disengage too easily. And we will get an occasion to do that near the end of this game, and you'll see just how monstrously oppressive this radar can be when a destroyer is caught inside of it. It's going to last for 40 seconds, which I think makes it the longest lasting radar in the entire game, and it's not something you want to come up against in a destroyer. Champagne out there, by the way, we get to see these torpedoes actually hit something and be quite effective in doing so. The Champagne is not exactly the most robust ship in terms of armor or torpedo protection, so it's really no surprise that we were able to hit him. I also want to say that, for my part in this game, this is perhaps not the most well-played Minotaur game, or the game where I find the best positioning in this ship. In fact, I probably could have been sunk at multiple points had the enemy simply paid attention to their mini-map and shot at me. We're going to finish off this champagne, though. These shells are so ridiculous at just finishing off low-health targets. It's insane. Honestly, there is not a more fun ship in the game for me right now than this ship. I love it. I'm going to be sad 
when Wargaming removes it from my port at the beginning of next week, it'll be like an anti-Christmas present of sorts. But even when they do, I'm not sure that I want to wail out this campaign. I was honestly thinking about it because I want to be able to play this ship. It's just so, so fun. But at the same time, if I wail out this campaign and get this ship, I might not be playing too much else for the foreseeable future. I need to play some other ships and diversify the content, you know what I mean? In any case... Things aren't going the best for my team here. Well, they weren't initially. We were down two ships to nothing, but we've managed to bring that up to three ships sunk on the enemy side and two ships sunk on ours. We hold the center cap. Our destroyer is inside of it. There's only a GK out there. He doesn't seem like he's going to be too much of a threat to that cap. So we're moving over toward the Charlie flank, where I believe a friendly Iowa who is stuck bow in versus an enemy Iowa and an Alaska has been pinging for our assistance basically this entire game and we are finally coming over here to oblige him as we do some open water gunboating against the GK. We're spotted by this Iowa and there's the Alaska around the corner but that Iowa is tunnel visioned on our teammate over there. If he weren't, he could easily shoot at us. His 16 inch guns would overmatch our 16 millimeter bow plating easily and he could probably do a fair amount of damage but we're done shooting at the gk now it's time to provide some artillery support for our teammate over here who judging by his position on the minimap does now appear to be mostly broadside to these guys so i don't think he's going to be floating for too much longer and in the time i've been talking both teams have been hemorrhaging ships it's four versus four right now so we do need to even the odds and because of our insane dpm we can hopefully do that we found a nice little nook here behind this island where the iowa can't quite see us although we're reversing too much again this ship is very very glidey when it's going forward or in reverse and you want to bring it to a stop you have to account for a lot of time because the ship will continue moving even when you change the direction of the throttle. In any case, this Iowa, for failing to shoot at us, he is going to pay dearly. You can see even when he's angled, so long as we hit these armor-piercing shells into his superstructure, they are able to penetrate that and do damage. And it's not a lot of damage with each shell hit. Sometimes it is, but you add all that up together and it becomes quite significant indeed. We're angled here, so we are able to get the Iowa shells, I think, to hit our citadel plating. And therefore, they are able to mitigate some of the damage. The Alaska, on the other hand, citadels us right there through the bow. So we do have to speed forward here very quickly. Try to get this Alaska off the board. We can't afford to take another shot like that. And luckily, our teammate helps us finish the Alaska off. Now it's just the Iowa, who I'm thinking at this point, well, I'm so close to him, and I can keep this island between myself and the Iowa for a time. The Iowa still has somebody on my team to shoot at, so if he shoots at them, which he did, I can come around this corner. I have 30 seconds to kill this guy before he can kill me. Not necessary, though. One of the torpedoes hits him and takes him out for our second kill of the game. Now it's three versus two in our favor, but this Charlie cap is completely unclaimed. So we're going to get in here and claim it for our team. We've got a friendly Fletcher left, I believe. He's right in front of us. And then there's a cruiser further out toward our spawn area in the center of the map. That cruiser is going to be taken out by this gross occur first R, I do believe which is going to leave me and the Fletcher versus the Gross Akurfirst and the Shimakaze. Now, the Gross Akurfirst, in my mind, not very big of a threat. Would I like to farm him out for a crap ton more damage? Absolutely, I would. But in a situation like this, this is important for you to realize that if you have the two cap advantage, which we are about to have here, and it's a low number like this, two versus two, the points are basically even right now, 
Well, since we have the two cap advantage, we are going to overtake the enemy on points right now. And we're going to stay ahead of them on points so long as none of us sink and so long as nobody takes the Bravo cap for the red team. Which means the way that we win this game is by protecting the Bravo cap. We get spotted by the Shimakaze. We know he's in our radar range, so we're able to activate the radar and he is spotted for the next 40 seconds. He can't disengage. There's an island right behind him, so he can try to turn into the island, but he's still gonna be well within our radar range. Shooting at him, you can see our armor-piercing shells tear him apart. We get the high-caliber metal, and he is dodging a little bit, which is making it somewhat tricky for us to land all of our shells on target. He does kind of beach there against the island, which throws our shots off even more. Radar's about to run out though, and unfortunately we're not going to be able to take him down while the radar is still running. We want to get behind this island though to make sure he can't spot us. The Grossa Kerfurst could come out of Alpha at any time and have shots on us if we are spotted. But the radar has driven the Shimakaze out of the Bravo cap, meaning our team still hold it, and these are the victory conditions. This Fletcher and I do not have to do anything. All we have to do is make sure this Shima does not take Bravo. We don't have to sink the Shima. We don't have to sink the GK. All we have to do is hold on to this cap until the end of the game. I'm harping on this because it's important for you to recognize these kind of win conditions in games like this. The Mighty Jingles, who you may or may not watch, but who I watch regularly, often talks about the phenomenon that grips teams when they have their victory conditions set up like this. All they have to do is play safe, defend what they've already taken, not push into the enemy, and not try to aggressively sink them. But they just can't help but to try to win harder. Now, there's a bit of a cheek-clutching moment right there as we get spotted by the Shima somehow. I'm not sure exactly where he is. We're no longer spotted. But that momentary spotting does allow the GK to take a shot at us. Thankfully, he misses, so no harm, no foul. But he could have dev-struck us there. It's very possible to dev-strike the Minotaur. You really just have to hit it right in the Citadel. Again, the armor plating on the Citadel, which is one of those typical British Citadels. It looks like one of those platforms that the medalists stand on in the Olympics with two winged platforms that are a little bit lower and the center platform raised up high. Basically, any battleship AP shells hit that armored part of the ship. They will penetrate. They won't over-penetrate, and they'll probably dev-strike you. It's one of the balancing factors of this ship, which is so, so very squishy. It's truly a glass cannon. The Shimakaze, though, he gives it up. He's no longer interested in drawing that game out. So he basically surrenders. We're able to take him out there, and we win the game. So there's a look at the radar minotaur and uh, some of the interesting things you can do with it. I hope you enjoyed this in lieu of the lion video, but I will have that up soon. I'll just have to play it a little bit tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.